would you follow? Whether you are a, a generation Z, a millennial, generation alpha, or from an older generation, we all follow someone, all of us. Whether it's on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, we like to follow people, right? The question is, who are you following? And where is this person taking you to? We need to be careful, right? We need to be very careful. We need to know who the person is and where the person is taking us because the person we are following can take us to a destination that we don't want to get there. We don't want to get to the final destination. So we need to be very careful whom we follow. A few years ago, in 1994, um, there was a film called Forrest Gump. And Forrest Gump, one day, he decides to start running. And he runs. And he runs. And he runs. And runs. And runs. After three years, two months, and 14 days, he stops. And he looks back. There is a huge crowd of people following him for a long period of time. And he says, I'm pretty tired. I'm going home. And one of the followers then asks, what's next? <laughs> They were following him, not knowing who he was or where he was going to. And now they are all lost. They are all lost. Who do you follow? Where are you going to be careful? Why are we studying the Gospel of Mark? Because Mark wants us to understand who Jesus is, right? His identity. He wants us to make sure that we know who Jesus is. And he wants us to understand his mission. He wants us to understand where Jesus can take us to. And he wants us to understand what it means to follow Jesus. So here's the big idea for us today. Peter of Mark wants us to understand that Jesus is the everlasting King, the eternal King, who offers everlasting life. Therefore, we should all follow Him. All of us should follow this everlasting King who takes us to everlasting life. And the aim for today is just to look at this Bible passage of Mark chapter 8 from verse 22 to 38. Because I want you to follow the right person <laughs> who can take you to the right destination. I don't want you to get lost. I don't want you to end up in a place that you would regret for the rest of your life. <clears throat> Let me pray before we dive into this Bible passage. Father God, we thank you so much for these many weeks we spent looking at the Gospel of Mark. And as we reach the middle of the Gospel, would you please help us to fully understand who Jesus is? to comprehend what his mission is so that we can desire with our hearts to follow him. Help us here, Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me break this big idea that Jesus is the everlasting king who offers everlasting life by breaking it in two parts. The first part is 
Jesus is the everlasting King. We're going to read from verse 22. If you have your Bibles, why don't you leave it open? In Mark chapter 8 from verse 22. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow my slide here. When they arrived in Bethsaida, and I'm going to stop here. Do you remember last time we were looking at Mark? Jesus was in a boat with his disciples, and he asked them a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Why you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? Your, you have eyes, won't you see? You have ears. Don't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? Verse 21, don't you understand yet? And you expect the disciples to reply, right? But that's not what Mark records here. Mark records Jesus arriving in this place called Bethsaida. When he arrived there, some people brought a blind man to Jesus. And they begged him to touch the man and heal them. So some friends bring to Jesus a blind man. And they ask Jesus to touch the man. They even tell Jesus how to perform a miracle now, right? Touch him. But what does Jesus do in verse 23? Jesus took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the village. Interesting, isn't it? Why not in the village? Well, we'll find out later. Then, what does Jesus do? Something that I keep telling my, my kids not to do, okay? Does he touch the blind man? No. He's spitting on the man's eyes. Oh, yucky. Disgusting, isn't it? He laid his hand on him and asked, can you see anything now? Let me stop here. So again, Jesus had a lot of questions to the disciples. Mark does not record any kind of answer. Instead, he records this episode of friends bringing a blind man and, and friends who tell Jesus how to perform miracles. And Jesus clearly shows us and them. It's not, it's not about how the miracle is performed. The important thing is who is performing the miracle. I don't even need to touch. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus is God. He has power and authority over sickness, over everything. He doesn't need to touch. And Jeff was helping us a few weeks weeks ago to understand why Jesus would use this saliva in order to heal. Yeah, at that time, people would assume that through your saliva, you would have healing. I mean, um, um, it, would, it would have a healing um, effect on people. But we know that that's not the way we, we help people, blind people, right? That's not the way. And Jesus, being God, he knew that. So my assumption here, Jesus, Jesus is just showing to the people around him. Don't think that through a formula you can heal people. It's not about the formula. It's about the person performing the miracle. Jesus himself. And he takes him out of the village. Okay? Why? My assumption is that village was going to face God's judgment soon. How do you know that, Alex? Well, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 22, Matthew tells us the following. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. And here's what Jesus says. What sorrow waits you for a sin and bad Said. For if the miracles that did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, her people would have repented of their sins 
long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. That city was meant to face judgment because they had the evidence, but they didn't care. They had the evidence that Jesus is God. They saw the miracles, but they did not repent. They rejected Jesus. In the same way, the Pharisees, the religious leaders in chapter 8 from verse 11 had rejected Jesus. And Jesus asks in verse 23, part D, can you see anything now? He asks who? Who is this asking this question? To the blind man. Can you see? The man looked around. Yes, he said. I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Ooh, did Jesus run out of battery? If he, if he, if he has all the power, what happened to his power now? It looks like that spitting on someone's eyes doesn't help. Is that, is that what is happening here? Why didn't the man see it properly? He said, they look like trees walking around. Well, let's see what happens next. Verse 25. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. And his eyes were opened. Oh, it worked now. His sight was completely, completely restored. And he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away saying, Don't go back in the, into the village on your way home. Don't tell anyone. Don't go back to your village. As I said before, they will face what they need to face. Don't go back. My question is, why Jesus performed this miracle in two states rather than in one? Why did he do it? Well, I think there is a parable here. <laughs> Remember, he was in a boat asking questions to his disciples. And why was he asking so many questions to the disciples? Because they were doubting, right? They were not sure whether Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. And now Jesus is using this miracle to show us, yeah. In order to follow me, you need to clearly see. But sometimes that takes a while. So this parable here is showing that the disciples, they walked with Jesus for many years. They saw the miracles. They had the evidence, but they were still doubting. They could not see. They were like this blind man. They were like, yeah, Jesus, I can see a, a lot of evidence. I, uh, I, we don't fully understand who you are. But now, but now, Jesus is going to ask the disciples more questions. So Mark puts this miracle in the midst of a lot of questions, right? And in verse 27, we read, Jesus and his disciples left Galilee in the north and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them more questions. Who do people say I am? Jesus' identity, right? Who do people say I am? Verse 28, well, he replied, some say John the Baptist. Who was that? Wasn't he? We read a few chapters ago. He was decapitated. It can't be a resurrect, I mean, a reincarnation. What is going on here? Some say Elijah. And others say you are one of the other 
prophets. Verse 29. Then he asked them, the disciples, right? But who do you say I am? And these speakers replied, You are the Messiah. Very important statement, right? That's what Jesus wanted to hear. Finally, you see who I am. You can see now. What does that word mean? What does the word Messiah, Christ, mean? God's chosen one. The chosen king. But not a, an earthly king. The king of the entire universe. The one with full authority and full power. The sovereign God. Do you know what would happen to someone who makes that huge claim at that time? They will be killed. <coughs> But Peter was not afraid. You are the Messiah, the one we've been expecting. But Jesus warned them. Not to tell anyone about him. Why not, Alex? What is going on here? Why, why is he keeping this secret? If he's the Messiah, everyone needs to know about him. Well, he was killed because he made that claim. It was not the time to die. So he tells his disciples, Well done. You know who I am. You get my identity. Don't tell people. Not yet. Because it's not time to I'll stop here because we've got a lot here right got a lot here. so Jesus healed the blind man in two states not because he did not have the power to do it on the spot because he wanted the disciples to see themselves in that blind man It's a symbol of restoration of the disciples' his spiritual sight. And think about you now. <laughs> Did you go through a similar process as well? That people were introducing you to Jesus and you took a while to fully understand that he's not merely a prophet, a teacher, a good man, a God himself in our midst, the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one, the everlasting king. No one can destroy this king. No one can destroy his kingdom. So we began with a question, right? Who do you follow? I hope you choose to follow Jesus. Because he is the Christ. He is everlasting life. He is the kind of king who came not to be served, but to serve us. So what is the lesson here? We all should follow Jesus, but based on his true identity, okay? Rather than on speculation. So when Jesus turns to his disciples and asks them, who do people say I am? There were a lot of misconceptions about the Jesus' identity, right? And if we all go out right now and ask people on the street, do you know Jesus? Who is Jesus for you? Guess what? You're going to hear all sorts of different answers. So a lot of people heard a lot of things about Jesus. But not many people know who Jesus truly is. A lot of misconceptions. But my question for us this morning is, what about us here? Who is Jesus for you? Do 
you truly believe that he is the chosen one, the Messiah, the Christ? Mark is trying to help us here to understand that Jesus is the sovereign God. The one we should be following him with all our hearts, mind, strength, soul. This is huge. But maybe you are someone here who can't see properly. Maybe you're still blind. Maybe you're like Peter. You only see part of Jesus' identity. And there are still many things that you don't understand. And that's normal. That's okay. Keep exploring. But don't follow your doubts, okay? When I meet people who call themselves atheists, sometimes I wonder, do you you understand what you're saying? (laughs) To call yourself an atheist, you need to believe for sure that there is no God. You need to maybe embrace the Big Bang theory. It's a theory. Is that is that what you're gonna follow? <laughs> Be careful. Or maybe, maybe an agnostic. I'm not sure. Well. Be sure as, as soon as possible. Because the ignorance won't save you. Explore. Keep exploring. Don't allow your doubts to guide you. Remove those doubts. How? By exploring. We offer, right, Jeff? Christianity Explore 3 to 1. Vox Explore. Because the ignorance won't save you. What do you mean by that, Alex? Well, you know how I drive here, right? So last week, I was fined 65 pounds. Why? Well, I stopped in a, in, a, in a lane that was only allowed for disabled people. But on my box, there was nothing written on it. There was one written behind. So when I arrived... The guy who was giving the fine, he said, I said, well, you can't put your seat. There was no sign here on my block. He said, well, can you see those two lines in front of your box? That means it's also for disabled. And I said, I didn't know. He said, you're still getting the fine. <laughs> Ignorance won't save you. On the day of the judgment, you can't say to God, I didn't know that Jesus was the everlasting king I should be following. So I follow all sort of different things. God, I was ignorant. I didn't know. I wasn't sure. I was an agnostic. That won't save you. That won't save you. So don't allow your doubts to guide you. Follow Jesus with the things you understand now. And when you open the book of Mark... This is all Mark is trying to do. He's helping you to explore. Can't you see that Jesus is the Messiah? And he will help you to see more. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? If you do, can you help someone who is exploring? Can you help? Someone to understand Jesus' true identity. If you follow him, you need to be influencing, helping others around you. You can't be that selfish to think, I understand who Jesus is, therefore, I'm not going to help others. That's wrong, right? So help others. But if you still struggle to believe, Ask people for help. I wish there was someone on that street last week I could ask, can I park here? (laughs) That would save me 65 pounds. (laughs) But we're talking about the spiritual things here, right? That can save you for all eternity. 
can save your life. So ask people around you to help. If you're not 100% sure that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Messiah, the, circum the second person of the Trinity, the Sovereign One. Let's carry on. Because we know that Jesus is the everlasting King, but He's also the one who offers everlasting life. How? How can the everlasting King offer us everlasting life? We're going to read from verse 31 to 38. And by the way, this is one of my favorite, favorite parts of the book of Mark. It's the middle of the book for a reason. Let's read from verse 31. Then Jesus began to tell that the Son of Man... Wait, Alex. I thought, I thought Peter had said that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. Why is he using a different title now? The Son of Man. Oh, he's using a, a title that um, it was used by Daniel in chapter 7, verse 14. When Daniel has this vision, a prophecy that in the future, this powerful being, God himself, would look like a man. And who is this man? Jesus. Yes, the Son of Man. They've been expecting the Son of Man to come. The King with all the power to come. And Jesus says, and then Mark says, then Jesus began to tell then the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. In other words, instead of being worshipped by those who knew the scripture, he's going to be rejected. He's going to suffer terrible things. He would be killed. Good news. But three days later, he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter. Peter was the one who has just made a huge claim. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. We are expecting Peter to say another amazing, astonishing, mind-blowing thing, right? Come on, Peter. What are you going to say now that Jesus has revealed his mission? I came to suffer, I came to be rejected, I came to be killed, I came to rise from the dead after three days. Peter took him, Jesus, aside and began to reprimand, to rebuke him, to tell him off, the disciple, telling the master off. Wow, Peter is bold for saying such things. Maybe Jesus is going to say, you're right, Peter. How silly I am to say those kind of things. I am the Messiah. I've got all the power. Why am I going to be allowed to be killed, to be rejected? What does Jesus do? Verse 33. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples. Then he reprimanded Peter. Jesus is going to say something to Peter here that I would never, I would never like to hear from God himself, right? Get away from me, Satan. He said, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. So this Peter, who had just said something amazing, now he's been told off by Jesus. You've been led not by God, Peter. You've been led by Satan. Who do you follow? Be careful. 
Okay. Be careful. Verse 34. Then calling the crown to join his disciples, he said. So he's, he has just explained his mission, right? He came to die and rise after three days. Now he's going to explain his disciples what it means to follow him. Right? We've got Jesus' identity, Jesus' mission. Now let's understand what it means to follow Jesus. If any of you wants to be my follower, you need to be on the internet. You need to have an Instagram account. You need to be on Twitter, Facebook. Yeah? If you want to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Oh, Alex, this is hard because we are human beings. We are selfish. So it's hard to follow Jesus. But that's not all. Jesus also says, take up your cross and follow me. So don't be selfish. Face whatever you need to face because you follow me. You know, we've got brothers and sisters in certain places of the globe who take the, their cross properly. They face persecution. Not the kind of persecution we face here. What kind of persecution do we face here? Psychological persecution. Oh, I said that I was a believer and people were mocking me. Oh, yeah, that's horrible. I don't want you to face that. But there are brothers and sisters who face death when people find out they are followers of Christ. And why do they do it? Because they understand what it means to follow Jesus. You need to take up your cross. If you try to hang on, verse 35, to your life, sorry, you lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Yeah, we live in a world that can offer you a lot of things, right? You might be following people who tell you, who, who influencers who tell you, do this, do that, and life will be nice. That's Yeah, yeah, that's true, isn't it? It's true. But Jesus is saying, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Who do you follow? Are they helping you to focus on spiritual matters? Or are they just trying to distract you? It could be on social media, okay? Okay, Generation Z or Alpha. They could be on social media, but they are everywhere. Who are the people influencing you to gain the whole world? But not helping you to think about God's kingdom. The only kingdom that is eternal. This earth here is not. The things that you gain here, you're going to lose them. Right? That's what Jesus is trying to say. Be smart. <laughs> Follow me. If anyone, verse 38, is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus is the everlasting King the only one who can offer you everlasting life. Proper life. Life with God himself. A relationship that has been broken because of our sins. And how was that possible? It was possible because Jesus came. The King of Kings came 
as I said before, not to be served, but to serve as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45 or 9, 45. Now, my name, let me check here. That's right, 1045. What does he mean by that? Not to be served, but to serve as a ransom. Well, he died on a cross, not because he did not have the power to free himself, not because he could destroy those who were trying to destroy him. He did it because of us, because of his followers. He gave us the opportunity not to die spiritually in hell forever. He died on a cross in our place. God himself as a sacrifice. And then he rose after three days, proving that he was not a liar, not a crazy man, but the everlasting king who can't be destroyed, offering eternal life to whoever believes in him, offering eternal life to those who follow him with all their hearts. Who follow him. Who do you follow? Is it, is it Jesus that you follow? Like the blind man. Peter was half blinded. He saw Jesus as the Christ. But didn't see Jesus. As the suffering Messiah, the one who came to die in our place, offering salvation. What is the lesson for us? Well, the lesson is that we should follow Jesus because we love him. Not to get what we love, right? <laughs> Don't be selfish. Why do you follow Jesus? Is it because he is the most important thing to you? Why do you follow Jesus? Is it because he's, he's the one who gives you the satisfaction that you can't find in anything or anyone else? Is that the reason why you follow him? Or you follow him to get something that you Love. I'm going to follow Jesus so he can give me what I love. My promotion. My boyfriend. My husband. My wife. My, I don't know, money. And the list goes on and on. Why do you follow Jesus? We should follow him because we love him. But many people want to follow Jesus in, in their own way, right? And today, I hope we all learn that that's not how it works in God's kingdom. You don't follow the king of the kings in the way you want to follow. You follow him by giving up your own life because you know that it's worthy. The hope Jesus will give us is eternal hope. Are you willing to follow him no matter what it takes? I'm going to repeat the question, okay? And think carefully about this question. Are you willing to follow Jesus no matter what it takes? When people say bad things about Jesus, will you say, Jesus is my King, my Savior, the one I love? 
How far are you willing to go in following Jesus? As we take a break from this gospel, I want you to understand that Mark, Mark helped us to understand that Jesus is the everlasting king, the one whose mission was to die on a cross. In our place, he died the death we should have died. And he says, to follow Jesus means deny yourself. Face whatever you need to face to follow Jesus, no matter the cost. Jesus is the everlasting king who offers everlasting life to those who follow him on the pathway to everlasting fulfillment. Life only makes sense with Jesus. So, you might be listening to this online right now or here in our midst. And Mark made it clear to you that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of Man, the King of Kings, the everlasting King, Lord of Lords. He made it clear that Jesus came to save us from hell by dying on a cross to pay for our sins, not because he had done anything wrong, and that he rose from the dead after three days, proving that he is the everlasting God. Maybe you don't believe in that yet. Here's my suggestion to you then. Keep exploring. Surround yourself with people who can help you. Explore. While you still alive. Alex, are you trying to make me feel fearful? Yes. <laughs> yes. Before it's too late. That's what doctors do, isn't it? I had an appointment on Friday and the doc was pretty clear. I said, wow, this is a lot. You say I might have this? Wow, be careful how you say it. Did I say that to him? And I said, wow, thank you. Or let me know. <laughs> so see me as a kind of doctor now who is trying to help you to get healed, spiritually speaking. But maybe you're not someone who has doubts. Maybe you are a believer who knows who Jesus is, why he came, what it means to follow him. Can I encourage you to keep following him? With all your heart. Knowing that no man is on the way. He loves you. He welcomes you. He offers you everlasting life. You can even be ready to die for Christ. Do you understand that? If someone gets through that door right now. <laughs> saying, if you don't, if you don't. Reject Jesus, I'm going to kill you. That person can kill us, but we will still live. Who else can offer that to us? Nobody else. Just Jesus. Follow him. Because he offers everlasting life. Life with God himself. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much for today and we thank you for this series. We thank you for the book of Mark. We thank you for the, everything we've learned. And I pray that you give us the boldness and the confidence that we need to keep following you no matter what. I pray right now, especially for those who are still uh, doubting who still don't know whether they should follow you or not. I pray that through your Holy Spirit, you may heal their blindness, Father. Would you please give them spiritual eyes, vision, so they can see 
as Peter saw you. I pray that you help them to not only see with their eyes, but also love you with their hearts. I pray in Jesus' name.